Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Douglas County School District Parent University. My name is Stacy. I work with the Communications Department, and I want to welcome you to our webinar on elementary literacy, the importance of reading aloud with your child. I'm so glad you could join us. I'd like to introduce our guest tonight um, is uh, Kathy Tyrrell from the Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Department. She is the Literacy Interventions Coordinator. So today we'll be learning about why reading aloud is important, what kind of questions to ask your child, how to choose the right books to expand their independent reading, and how to, and how to strengthen your parent-child relationship through quality time spent reading together. Um, and I am going to send out a poll before we get started. I sure would appreciate your answers. Um, and oh, one moment. <laughs> Let's see. And I'd like to hand it off to Kathy here so that she can she can start working with you. If you just joined us, please be sure to fill out the poll um, that's been sent out. And if you have any questions during this, um, during this presentation or after this presentation, please you just use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll be able to answer questions and, um, and have a little bit of a conversation at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, Stacy, can you see my screen? Yep, we're all set. Yay. All right. Hi, everyone. In this short segment of 30 minutes that we have together, I'm hoping to um, explore with you some importance of read alouds, questions that you can ask your child when you're reading together, and maybe even how to choose just right books for independent reading so that they can engage in books when they're reading by themselves. I truly believe that reading aloud together provides the opportunity to talk and have meaningful conversations. And it also, it is so great in strengthening the relationships. And not only do kids fall in love with books and reading and they get better at it, they learn to deeply understand different perspectives and they, they really do um, develop this joy of reading. So let's get started. Kids really do love to look at pictures and books and explore what they, um, what they're reading and they want their reading to come alive. And this was a great illustration that I had uh, that I found just on looking at images. And this is what I think of books. Like when you open a book, it really does come alive, especially for kids who are begin to read like uh, picture books, but also when they get into chapter books and um, throughout their elementary level, middle school and high school. So did you know that it only takes um, about 10 to 15 minutes a day to improve reading for your child when you do read aloud? And it not only improves their reading, but it also strength, strengthens the uh, relationship that you have with your child. I want to share with you an example of how reading has impacted my own children. I have three children who are now in college and I was um, going through my son's room who is now 22 and I was looking for something and came across a book that he kept out of all of the books that we, we went through from birth to when he was in high school of reading aloud, there was one book that I found and it was this book, When I Was a Boy, I Dreamed. I used to go to all these reading conferences and I always brought home a read aloud book for my kids every time I would go. And this one book is something that he absolutely loved. And this is why whenever he wanted to read it over and over and over again, because every page of this book is about a different dream 
theme that the author had. I'm going to read this particular page that was his favorite. I want you to notice a, something about the pictures of the book that came alive for my child. He noticed that by looking at the pictures and the details of these pictures, he expanded his thinking, his wonder, his imagination. He always pointed out the face on the shark down here of how happy the shark looked. He also thought it was hilarious that this pirate right here was in his underwear. And these pirates up here were hiding and they were up in a, up on trying to get to the top of the ship so that they would not go to the to the end. So I'm going to read with you um, just one page of this book and see what you enjoy and what you get out of it. I dreamed of ocean battles. On the high seas, I was boss, would hunt down evil pirates, and we would get them onto the ledge, and I would toss them over. I chased off all those buccaneers. The worst was fearsome Frank in his stripy little underwear and made him walk the plank. So in this discussion of every page was a different dream, we had different discussions about how he dreamed. The great thing about this is that we not only talked about how, what he dreamed at night, but we talked about his dream of what he wanted to be when he grew up and how that emerged over time really developed that uh, relationship and that creativity for my child. So that is one example of a read aloud. Throughout this session of the short time we have, I'm gonna show you different ways to have read alouds with your child and questions that you can ask. So in the beginning, every first of all, every child is a reader. They engage with the books and even though they can't read the words, they're still a reader. So let's talk a little bit about what I what the research says. So as I was reading over the years, I've read tons and tons of research about the importance of read alouds. And one research that I came across, they did a poll for parents and for kids. And what they found is that reading aloud to children peaks at about age five. Now, I can tell you probably one reason why it peaks, just from my own personal experience of being a single mom, you work full time, you come home and you, you have to make dinner, you clean up dinner, you give your kids a bath, and guess what? You're exhausted, but your kids still want to be with you. So instead of it peaking at five, why not make that longer? So they pulled some children in uh, from the ages of six to 14, 80% of those set kids said that they wish that their parents had read with them longer. And 90% of parents stated that it was the most special time that they had. Also, the REACH search has uh, suggested that reading aloud to your child increases their language development, their vocabulary development, and they have deeper comprehension. Because when you read aloud to a child, it releases all that pressure from them where they can just listen and engage and play like a little movie in their head. Uh, one more point about what the research says is that there are three predictors that children will become uh, frequent readers in the future. One of them is that they understand that reading is for enjoyment. And if you are another predictor is if the parents are frequent readers, even if it's the reading on their phone or reading, um, reading newspapers in a, on the computer and that they believe their belief that reading is fun. So make it fun and don't make it a chore. So here are some other research um, research data that came up, that I found is they found this is from the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation. They found that reading aloud stimulates brain activity, and it promotes literacy skills. They're better at uh, letter recognition and advanced comprehension. This is the most uh, uh, astounding research that I've found is that. 
when you read aloud to a child, it's different than speaking to a child and talking to a child. Because when you read aloud, you use different vocabulary, different language structures, and you're exposing them to words that's going to increase that comprehension and their linguistic and cognitive experience that they're able to speak. And it's three times more likely to experience a new word type instead of whatever caretakers or uh, even teachers and friends have in their own speech. So I found that really interesting. So why read aloud to your child? It inspires the love of reading and it builds those positive relationships. And I could probably say that building positive relationships was not an end goal that I knew at the time. When I started reading with them when they were very, very young, like right out of the womb, and I read with them throughout as long as they wanted to read to me, what I found is that once they were in middle school, and they were kind of in their own world and reading on their phone. And, you know, when, when technology was more, more um, three-dimensional than it was when they were babies, is instead of reading aloud to them, they wanted to talk. They wanted to talk about their day. They wanted to share what was going on with them. They wanted to, they wanted to just express how they were feeling. So especially for my son, he just wanted that time to talk to me. So it all, also, it not only did it inspire their love of reading at the time, but it really made them open up to me. Now today, when I listen to my now adult children, that are in college, I want to close my ears and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I don't think I need to hear these things that you're doing. Have you ever felt that way? So um, building those positive relationships is probably one of the things that I value the most. Another thing that it does, especially for little kids, is it increases the print awareness because what they see whenever you read a book, I'm just going to show you a one a little book. So uh, hopefully you can see this. So what they see when you read is they know that the message, the words in the book, they have a meaning that you're reading actually words in a book. So they realize that there's a cover to the book, like their print awareness. There's a message in the book. You read the right page before the left page. And also there are letters in the book that make up words. So that print awareness and how you approach that is really important. So your simple books that you get like this, if you could, if it, if it uh, longer books, you can't do this, but simple word books, you can point to the words as you read it, because it shows that you go left to right across the text and there's a return sweep. So the print awareness that you get from reading aloud is really important, along with vocabulary and language development. I want to take a few minutes because one of the strongest predictors of pre-reading skills is phonological awareness. And I want to take just a couple of minutes to talk about the importance of phonological awareness. And you can get this by reading aloud. So phonological awareness is really about hearing. It's about what goes in the ears. And the oral language that children come with is the building block for reading. And that's where it all starts. Children must hear rhyme and they must hear vocabulary. And you do this through songs and poems, rhyming books, and it, it builds this phonological areas of the brain that helps them remember and hear different language structures, vocabulary, and rhyming. And rhyming is the first thing that you, uh, that kids are aware of. So, I'm going to show you this kind of continuum of how kids learn on phonological awareness. Phonological awareness is the big umbrella of hearing. So if you think about it, it's, it, it's kind of reading with the eyes closed. It's what you hear. First of all, kids start off very, very early and listening, listening to you, listening to your language, listening to the birds outside. It's all about listening. Then they start hearing rhyme and alliteration. The next step is as you read to them, they start noticing, oh, these words are making up a whole sentence. 
Then as they get into kindergarten and even preschool, kindergarten, then they start noticing that, oh, there are syllables within words. So then one thing that you could do is while you're reading, you can really practice on syllables. So the word, if the word is crumble, you could clap crumble and they can hear those word parts. Once they get, so basically you're going from, I think of it as an hourglass. You go from whole hearing story, hearing sentences, and then it gets smaller of hearing syllables. Then you get down to the word level and it's, um, it's really looking at what we call onset and rhyme. For example, if the word is fuzz, the f would be the onset, the us would be the rhyme. Then you move to segmentation of phonemes. So they go k, a, t. So you hear the individual. Then as they become better decoders and better readers, guess what? You go back to the big, you get little, and then you go back to now you're reading whole words and sentences again. So that's kind of the continuum of, of phonological awareness. And you can gain some of that when you're reading aloud. Here is an example. So I don't know if you know Llama Llama Loves to Read. This is a great book for early elementary, like preschool, kindergarten, even below like um, ages, toddlers up to kindergarten, where, <coughs> sorry about that, where it actually shows how, um, how you can hear for rhyme and how you also can get the alphabet. So this is a great book to, to demonstrate and to read aloud to your child. Throughout this session, I'm going to give you some examples of rhyming books and of other books to kind of give you some ideas. So whenever you read a, a book to a child, this is one of my, my favorite books, which is called Giraffes Can't Dance. And the first time you read a story is to read it for enjoyment, for laughter, for wonder and discoveries. And what do kids do, early, um, early age kids do? They want you to read the same book over and over and over again. If that is the case, go ahead and read it over and over again, because each time you read it, they're gaining something deeper. So I want to do a little activity with you, and it's kind of weird talking to a screen when I can't see your pitch, your faces, um, but I want to do a little activity. Let's say that you have read this two or three times with your, with your student, with your uh, child. The second time you read it, you can ask a child, you know what, I want you to listen for what sounds the same in some rhyming. So I want everybody here to listen for what sounds the same in the rhyme. And I want you to think about how is the focus different than just reading and listening. So in the chat, when you hear words that rhyme, I want you to just kind of um, put it in the chat of some words that you read. I'm not going to read this to you. It is actually someone reading the book and we're only going to do like the first or three pages. So let me Giraffes know, Stacey, if you can't dance. read it. I mean, if you can't By hear it. By Giles Andrier and Guy Parker Reese. Gerald was a tall giraffe whose neck was long and slim. But his knees were awfully crooked and his legs were rather thin. He was very good at standing still and munching shoots off trees. But when he tried to run around, he buckled at the knees. Now every year in Africa, they hold the jungle dance where every single animal turns up to skip and prance. And this year, when the day arrived, poor Gerald felt so sad because when it came to dancing, he was really very bad. So what did you hear that rhymed on those pages? I'm seeing a lot of uh, slim and thin dance and prance. We've got some sad and bad. Trees and knees. So this is something you could do with your child is to say, oh my gosh, what rhymed? What sounded the same? 
dance and prance. And then you could even get into vocabulary. What does it mean to dance? What does it mean to prance? And you can do this throughout the book as you read a book like this. And notice the characters. Notice how, they, how they're how they waltzing and what are warthogs and what else rhymes? Tango and bold. Does that rhyme? No, they don't sound the same, do they? So you can have these kind of discussions um, with your child. Now, you may ask, you know what? That is way too babyish for my kid. What do you do with older kids? Not only do you spend the special time, but the more you read more engaging books to them that's not so babyish, then they are going to get those deeper conversations. And I'm gonna show you what that means. Don't think that books are too babyish for your kids. Ask them what they want to read. Give, go to the library and say, you know what? What are some books that sound fun for us to read about tonight? Because the more you read, whether it be a novel or a, um, a picture book, they're going to be asking for for, to look at perspectives of analysis and reflection. And what they will also start to gain over time as you read with them is they're going to hear what good writing sounds like and they're going to replicate it. So when they hear those descriptive words and different play on words, they're going to want to write like that. And I swear reading aloud to a child is when I was in the classroom of um, sixth graders, I read to them every day, and then they did some writing. And we use those, we call them mentor texts. So we use the different writings, whether it be um, persuasion um, books or books with a lot of descriptive language, it really improved their writing ability. So let's talk about some questions to ask. What questions do you ask? I will say, don't ask too many questions because it disrupts the joy in the reading of the book. Stop at periods of time and ask them in a very genuine conversation of what is happening in the book, but don't make it a chore. So here are some questions that you can ask. What do you think is going to happen next? And then they respond. And if they're not giving you enough, say, tell me more. What do you think? Look at the face in this picture. Look at that shark. He's smiling. What are you wondering? Hmm. If you disagree with what they're saying or they're not on the right task or comprehending, you may want to want to model your thinking like, huh, my thinking is a little different. I think that he may be happy that all those people are on the ship. Or I have the same thinking as you. But this is a really important time when you do ask questions to not judge. Be a, have a general, genuine conversation but don't judge their responses or say you're wrong. That's not what they're thinking. So just answer it in a way where, huh, I'm wondering if. Some more specific questions might be after you read, who was your favorite character? How would you change the ending to the story? What would you do if this happened? What do you think about the decision that they made? These are some other different questions. So let's put it to work. I'm going to show you a story, which is one of, another one of my favorite books, and it's called The Great Buzz Frenzy. So when you question, try to ask open-ended questions and not yes or no questions to stimulate some of that discussion. So this is a book about some... Um, this is a book about a dog who is going to drop a ball in the hole of these prairie dogs. So when they drop, when he drops the ball, it's gonna go all the way down the hole and all of these prairie dogs are gonna, they don't know what it is. So let's kind of go through this. So in the beginning, they, the, the dog, Violet is the dog and he drops his ball down the hole and the beginning of the story says, down it went, boink, boink, run for your life, thump, thump. And it goes on all the way down the hall. 
until it reaches the end and it goes pluck. There it sat, perfectly still. The prairie dogs waited perfectly still. Then you could stop and ask, oh, what do you think? What do you think the prairie dogs, do they think, do they know that's a ball? What do they think it is? As the story goes on, they all the town of the prairie dog town, they hear that there is something in the hole. So they all run down the hole to figure out what it is. When they see this furry thing, this is what they start to do. They twisted it, braided it, danced and paraded it. It was a fuzz frenzy, a fuzz fiesta, a fuzz faint tingle. The whole prairie was a buzz about fuzz. So what's gonna happen? Are they taking all the fuzz off the ball? So as the story unfolds, they did pick it all out or off the ball. And one particular prairie dog got all the fuzz and he stole it and he put it all on himself. And he says, the prairie dogs froze. Then they raced up, up, up the long tunnel. They stood big bark covered with fuzz from head to top to tail. I'm the king of the fuzz, he snarled. Did they hear me? I'm the king of the fuzz. And the story goes on and then they're all at the top and he's bragging that he took all the fuzz, but then something happened. This page happened. Swoop, the sky went black. What are you wondering? What happened? What do you predict? This is the next page. What happened? Where's Big Bark? Look, there he was, high above their heads, dangling from the talons of an eagle. No more Big Bark, the crowd cheered. Yay! Don't yay, he's one of us, yelled Pip. We have to save him. How would you like to be in Eagle's lunch? No, the crowd yelled. How will they save him? So this is one way to use questions. Now, I'm not going to read what happened and how he was saved. You've got to go get the book. But I will say that at the end of the story, this was the page. What's the decision? What's going to happen next? And this was the last page of the book. Are they going to have fun? Is the ball going to drop in the hole again? Is there going to be chaos and fear and greed? What's your story? There you go. That's one example of a read aloud. Now, choosing read alouds is different between ages zero and three and um, kids in elementary school. So I am going to give you a resource page. And in this resource page, there's going to be some examples and some different books that you can go to the library or you can get online or in Amazon or at the Scholastic Book Fairs. But I suggest either um, getting books off of YouTube and some read alouds or going to the library to find some. Um, but this is one link that is one of my favorite websites. It's called Reading Rockets. You can find out all kinds of information about reading on this website, but they give you tons of, if you have a toddler at at home or a little one at home, they give you tons of great read alouds there. So let me get back here. Um, so this is the read alouds for zero to three. You need to make sure <laughs> that they can't tear the pages. So either waterproof books are good uh, so that they can um, have them in bathtubs or if they drool all over it or spill things on it. Thick pages are good. Look for rhymes and repetition pave the way for whatever the language development that you want to um, model for your child and consider the motor, the motor skills of choosing and the physical books of what, they're, what they feel like. 
Um, here's an example of a book with rhyme. Uh, Silly Sally, if you have never read this book, this is a great book too. Silly Sally went to town walking backwards up and down. And about every page has rhyme where they're listening for that rhyme. You may not be testing them on the rhyme, but the listening is the number one thing that you wanna get out of this. Wordless picture books are great. Here's an example of a wordless picture book. The great thing about this book is that you can make up a story every time they read it. Um, what I used to do with my uh, children when we would read this book is that I would start off by telling the story and make just making up a story of what's happening. And then I would say, oh, when we turn the page, I want to hear what your story is. So the child is creating story so that when they are in elementary school and they start writing stories, you have already uh, put forward what it's like to build your own stories. So picture uh, books are great in that respect. So how do you choose book for old books for older children? Pick a topic that's notice what they're interested in. Is it sports, um, cartoons? Um, do they read comic books? Uh, do they like more books that are uh, nonfiction books, like about animals or, or sports or, or our heroes of the day? Have an opportunity to share these wonders of what a book can tell you. Re for your reluctant readers or readers who, um, who are struggling with, um, with reading, I would pair them with audiobooks. So these are books that you can listen together or, um, or you can ask them to, to listen to books as they read. I have two resources down here. One of them is, this is a great one, it's called Storyline Online. And these are usually um, either celebrities or the authors reading books for kids. And it gives you tons of, of, of books that you can choose from. Another one is, if you're going to the library and you wanna know, gosh, what are the ages? Of, um, of books that's appropriate for my child. And there's a whole list right here for toddlers. You have, they have list of books ages six through 10. Um, they have middle, kids who are in middle school. These books, A Light in the Attic, if you haven't had that, that's a great book for poetry and to get them ready for reading poetry when they're in high school. They have ages 10 through 13 and it goes all the way up to 18. So if you have a child that wants to know, I don't know what book to read, they could actually, um, you could go to the Scholastic website and it actually will tell you what the, you know, the different age books for particular groups of kids. Now. This website will tell you when you click on a book, it will tell you to, um, to buy the book. Just go to the library and check it out. So that's how you would choose books, to help older children choose books. Another thing that you will um, probably, when you're reading a chapter book with an older child, it really, I wanna give you an example of how it will grow their vocabulary. So I wanna give you a little chance to just kind of relax. And I want to, for you to think about what this particular excerpt from Charlotte's Web, what it does for you as you listen, what does it remind you of? So after I finish reading this, I'd love for someone to share what this reminds you of in your own life. These autumn days will shorten and grow cold. The leaves will shake loose from the trees and fall. Christmas will come, then the snows of winter. You will live to enjoy the beauty of the frozen world. For you mean a great deal to Zuckerman and he will not harm you ever. Winter will pass. The days will lengthen. The ice will melt in the pasture pond. The song sparrow will return and sing. The frogs will awake. The warm wind will blow again. All these sights and sounds and smells will be yours to enjoy. Wilbur, this lovely world, these precious days. So this is just an expert and for excerpt. So if some of you have read Charlotte's Web, you know what's happening to Wilbur before he's gonna be butchered, but then they fall in love with Wilbur and they decide not to 
not to butcher him. So do I have any comments about what this, re how you can relate to this kind of reading in a book and what it will do for a conversation that you could have with your child? Any ideas? Nothing? When I was reading this to a class, um, a fourth grade class, they, we, they started sharing things like, yeah, boy, I was really upset the other night. And um, this reminds me of that things will be okay. The sun will shine. And when I would read this to my own children, they would say, yeah, sometimes I feel like I'm just in a dark hole, but I know that I'm going to be okay. So this is, it gives children a way into experiencing how they feel and how they relate to books. Now, you may say, you know what, I stopped reading to my child and I need to start again because I want to develop these strategies in children to really love books. It's never too late to start reading to your child, so do it gradually. You can take turns and if you have a child who's already reading or an avid reader, take turns and um, hook them. Say, let's read the book and then watch the movie. Switch things up. Create a time where you have a, I mean, create a space at home where you can have, um, have a library, a home library. And so you may think, oh my gosh, they can read now. So now what? Build up that independent library. So you have a library of some read alouds and some books that's above their independent reading level. Those are the books that you're gonna to read to them if they are not able to read the book. But then you're gonna have books that they can read. So you may ask, how can I choose just the right book for a child? So I'm gonna give you some strategies to help your own child choose just the right books. We call it the five finger rule. So the five finger, finger rule is you have a child go and pick a book and they read the first page or the second page of the book and they hold up their fingers. So every time they don't know a word, they hold up their finger. I don't know that word. So they keep reading and they hold up another one. So if they read the page and they, they only held up their finger three times, then it's the just right book for them. If they hold up the, their finger four times, they can go, oh, that's a little hard, but I'm gonna give it a try and maybe they can read it with you or with a buddy or with a sibling that's older. If they hold it up to five times, like they read, they didn't know five words on that page, then it's probably good, it's probably too difficult, but they may want to still read the book. So maybe that's, that's where you can decide that that's a good read aloud. So one finger, probably too easy for them. It's like, you know what, let's try a different book. Two to three fingers is going to be just the right book. So teach your child the five finger rule and it will help them choose just the right book. Well, there Kathy, are... Kathy, you have just so many great tools. Um, I'd love to jump in here and um, ask some questions that we got. Okay. Awesome. So um, one was, what's the different effects between kids reading aloud and parents reading aloud? Ah, so when kids read aloud, they are really engaged in the book of reading aloud. But when parents read aloud, the kids are pulled back from having to read the words on the page. And the listening, they're going to get deeper into the conversation that you're having after they read aloud. But they're also able to think more deeply about um, the content that you're reading. So it's a different effect. They're getting more content and they will uh, comprehend more deeply than if they're reading the book. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then we also had a couple of people express concern um, or at least challenges with reading to a bilingual kid. Um, so like if the parent's first language is in English and the kid is reading in English, you know, how, how could they best handle that? 
Yeah. So I think that, for example, if you are a Spanish speaking uh, mom and the, the, your child speaks um, English a little bit um, faster or better, then how can you support that? I would probably use the read aloud books and have them um, read aloud with your child. And your child could actually read to you and put him in kind of this situation where it's like, mom, let me read you a book. And then maybe they can translate some of the English and Spanish to you. But your read aloud books and your audio books is really going to um, help with that exposure. Mm -hmm. And you, you talked about this a little bit, but um, a lot of people are looking to see how can you make reading more fun? Oh, you know what? Take the pressure away of trying to teach. You know, reading aloud is really enjoying a moment together to make it fun. So when you're reading aloud, put the expression in, put the put the uh, action into the characters and really get kids to look in the book, have them become part of the book. Notice the pictures and notice what the expressions are. And But I think the most important thing there to make it fun is your voice when it changes up and down depending on what's happening in the book. Awesome. And if um, anyone else has any other questions, please, um, please submit them through the Q&A. We've still got a few minutes left when we can answer them. Um, Kathy, did you want to go over what these, um, what slide we're looking at now? Yeah, so I don't know how many teachers are in this session, but this book, the Ramped Up Read Aloud, and even for parents or if you homeschool, this is such a great book by um, um, a great book. And what it will do is it will give you the actual read aloud and what you can do with the read aloud, like their actual lesson plans. So you can go to the library and you can check out the book and it's a great book that, um, and then use the lesson plan to kind of know where to question, uh, where to stop so you're not guessing. So it's a great book for teachers and for parents. The other book is the Read Aloud Handbook. It's kind of an older book, but Jim Trulise is a great, um, he has done a lot of research on read alouds, but it gives you tons and tons of books. And it also gives you what the book is about because when kids go to the library to check out a book, they need to read the back of the book to see what it's about. But this actually will give you, um, you know, what age groups is appropriate for and maybe a little synopsis of what it's about. So that's a, that's a great resource. I also have a tiny URL, but I think that Stacy is going to send, send you uh, an email with some resources. I have put together some resources for you on some tips and some strategies here, and we will send this out to you um, that has just about everything that I talked about uh, tonight. And Kathy, you provided so many great resources and tools in your presentation. I think folks would really appreciate a copy of the presentation as well, don't you think? Oh, perfect. I can also share that. Yeah. Uh, this tip sheet is also in Spanish for those that um, are Spanish speaking. But at the very, very end uh, are some links. Uh, of the audio books. Um, I have some reading strategy bookmarks of how to, um, how to, and where, when kids are reading independently, they can use these bookmarks to help them to remind them of some strategies to use when they get stuck. Excellent. Well, yeah. I think we have to wrap it up here, unfortunately. Right. This has been so wonderful. It's been great having you, Kathy. Thank you so much for spending time with us and sharing oh. this fun knowledge and for oh, the, lovely, um, the lovely nod to Thanksgiving in your design. Yeah. Have a great Thanksgiving, everyone. We have lots to be thankful for. And thank you for listening today. Absolutely. And, you know, I just wanted to wrap something up real quick on behalf of Parent University. Um, we're always looking for feedback um, on how we can make this program, these webinars more effective, more helpful, more accessible. So I invite you to leave us, leave us some comments um, either at the bit.ly on the screen um, or you can also scan that QR code as well. That will take you to the survey. Um, and this is the last webinar for the year of 2021. Uh, we'll resume back in January and um, we'll be sending out some more information on what you can expect in the spring semester. It's going to be some good stuff. Um, and anyway, hope that you all have a lovely evening. 
Thank you again for joining us um, and have a great Thanksgiving break. <laughs>